So what can be done to return society to a biblical judicial system? In this section, we'll cover two main avenues to recovering a free society, the establishment of voluntary and private courts, and jury nullification. So let's talk about private Christian courts. In light of what's been said so far in reference to biblical courts, the most important thing we can do today is to attempt at all costs, as far as possible, as often as possible, to settle interpersonal disputes privately. And what does this look like in practice? We'll also discuss the commitment to Christian virtue that's necessary to make that work. For Christians, private settlement means first, forgiveness whenever possible. Secondarily, it means private Christian courts. Now, this was Paul's main argument to the Corinthians, which we reviewed uh, in our earlier section. Christians need to recover this doctrine, put it back in practice. In general, Christians should, number one, appeal only to Christian courts. Number two, allow only Christian judges or arbitrators to resolve the disputes between brethren. And number three, only allow biblical law as the standard of judgment in those cases. Four, provide only such remedies or restitution as biblical law allows. And number five, provide some measure for finality of the decision. Now let's consider each one of these five aspects because they're very important. The first is an application of the idea of sovereignty. Christians have one ultimate king and judge and lawgiver, and that is the triune God. It is He who presides ultimately over all of life. Only courts that honor Him ultimately have validity. The universe is His courtroom, and no one has removed the Ten Commandments from the walls of that courtroom, nor will they ever. The point is intimately tied with the other four, but especially with point three, and that is the point of law. Law in every society is ultimately religious in origin. And the source of law in any given society is that society's God. Christians, as members of God's holy society, the temple of God on earth, if you will, from 1 Peter 2, 5 through 10, must recognize the ultimate validity only of God's law and thus of God honoring courts. Courts judging according to some other legal standard are courts of some other God as well. No matter how much, any constituent part or party of any case may say, so help me God. Now this has major implications. Christians must generally consider modern state courts to be mostly ungodly. However they've been originally founded, they have long since abandoned, as we've seen, any formal recognition of Christian law and have instead embraced Justice Holmes' uh, humanistic standard of evolutionary relativistic law. Granted, some traces of Christian judicial heritage may remain, but traces only indicate the past history. They do not legitimize the courts as still acceptably Christian today. We'll address secular courts more in a moment. For now, it's expedient just to acknowledge uh, the apostasy that's involved there and avoid them as much as possible. Paul's admonishment to the Christians uh, seems to have had some precedent, precedent in Jewish rabbinical law, which ties it, of course, to the entire Bible. The Mishnah, which is an early collection of ancient rabbinical deliberations and forms the basis for the later Talmud, which Orthodox Jews read today, contains a strikingly similar opinion. It says, quote, A bill of divorce given under compulsion is valid if it's ordered by an Israelitish court. But if by a Gentile court, it's invalid. The Jewish legal scholar George Horovitz uh, refer, uh, refers to the phrase, quote, tribunals of idolaters, when he quotes from the Talmud, which is commentary upon that earlier section of the Mishnah. And it says this, quote, If it is impossible to adjust amicably, and the parties must go to law, they should resort to a bet din, that is Hebrew for house of judgment, of Israel. It is forbidden to litigate before judges of tribunals uh, or tribunals of idolaters, even when their law is similar to Jewish law, and even when both parties agreed to submit their case before them 
and even if they bound themselves thereto by a kenyan, which is, again, a Hebrew word for a binding agreement, or by some other instrument in writing. Such agreements are null and void. In other words, these Jews considered non-Jewish courts to be courts of idolatry. Since they did not submit themselves to biblical law, they must have submitted to a false idol, a false god. It's important to see that Paul was applying a very similar mindset when he's instructing the Christians in 1 Corinthians 6. As Christians, we dare not run to pagan courts. That would be a form of idolatry. But rather, we should despise those courts as inferior to Christian law and to private Christian courts. God's law, God's court, must be made preeminent by Christians, who then, by the way, uh, must expand godliness outwardly into the state courts where it is lacking. One scholar, R.J. Rushduni, explains it this way, quote, When a state or its laws are godly, its courts are legitimate and can be used. The state then, despite its sins and shortcomings, is an aspect of the kingdom of God. Present civil law is in process of becoming radically humanistic, but its framework is still, to a large degree, biblical. It is the duty of Christians not to withdraw from civil law, for example, the law of the state, but to make it biblical. Secondly, let's talk about representation. Closely related to the issue of sovereignty is the second aspect, and that is representation of authority. Every court has representatives, representatives of its sovereignty, earthly incarnations of its authority, and that is its judges. And God's court is no different. And in fact, it is the original uh, in that process. Ideally, all civil judges' oaths of office would include swearing allegiance to Jesus Christ and to His Word. They would be His representatives. But, of course, this is not the case today. In a decentralized world, of course, we would have a much better chance of having our local judges, at least, willing and able, legally, to take such an oath. But, of course, again, we're not there yet. In the meantime, every judge represents the law of his court, and thus the source of that law. An idolatrous court is an idolatrous jurisdiction, and should not be accepted as ultimate for the Christian. Again, R.J. Rushduni gives an explanation, quote, A judge or court whose premise is other than the law of God is an untrustworthy administrator of justice. Justice is not impossible with such a man, but it is not to be expected. The moment a judge begins representing a law other than the law of God, that judge is representing a false law, and his court has assumed the position of a false god. If church or state or any other agency function as the creator of law, i.e. issuing laws without a transcendental basis, then they have made themselves into gods. Their right to command is then gone. In light of this, Christians should seek only Christians as arbiters of their disputes. Indeed, they should preferably seek Christians who have an understanding of whom they represent as judges, and the word according to which they are supposed to judge. We want to submit only to judges who in turn submit to God and His word. Now this is not to say, of course, that all Christian elders and arbitrators and judges of all kinds, uh, as opposed to all pagan judges, will always be uh, perfectly just in their sentences. But justice, honestly, uh, and, and uh, impartiality are to be expected from godly leaders, whereas such are unexpected of judges who refuse to submit to the rule and law of Almighty God, uh, who has compromised the deity to begin with in that way. Christians should therefore seek out willing and able Christians to arbitrate and settle disputes among them. Thirdly, let's talk about the standard of Christ. We've already said enough about the third aspect uh, of biblical courts, and that is law. It takes center stage throughout the process. It infuses each of the other aspects uh, through the standard. Uh, it is the standard throughout uh, the whole process of, of God and His sovereignty, God and His Word. 
every court must submit to God's law, else the Christian cannot accept that ultimately as authoritative. Now, this raises questions, of course, which I'll address in, min in a minute, but more importantly, every Christian and every church must accept God's law as the standard of every area of life, of structuring family life and business life, and of, quote, to quote Paul, judging the world, 1 Corinthians 6 again. Unless the individuals and their respective leaders within the church accept the godly standard, we can hardly expect it ever to be adopted as a source of conflict revolution by the civil courts. And more importantly, we can hardly expect the blessing of the final judge who gave us that law to begin with. Without embracing God's law, Christians today are despite whatever growing numbers and massive churches we may display, absolutely lawless in the eyes of our God. So let's talk about biblical remedies. The fourth aspect is sanctions is tied to the law as well. Christian courts must seek remedies and resolutions to problems that are applications of God's sanctions as revealed in His law and no further. For example, the Bible provides clear guidelines for the restitution of property in several types of cases. There are different degrees of theft, of embezzlement, of negligence, of workers' responsibilities, and more. Read them in Exodus 22. Christian judges should study these cases carefully to determine the biblical guidelines which apply and then declare accordingly. Decisions that go beyond these boundaries even if they're determined by secular authoritative courts, should not be accepted by the Christian. Biblical sanctions will provide godly justice and at the same time prevent frivolous cases, malicious cases, cases of greed and envy and human whim. Consider, for example, the famous hot coffee lawsuit from a biblical point of view. You remember this case, I'm sure. A woman sued McDonald's after she spilled her coffee and suffered third-degree burns on 6% of her body. Since the restaurant served its coffee far beyond the temperature of any other, uh, near the boiling point in fact, the liability issue is strongly against the restaurant. Meanwhile, the woman uh, herself originally only asked for her medical expenses to be covered, which was about $20,000. But the case escalated, went national. The jury eventually awarded her $200,000 in compensation, plus a whopping $2.7 million in punitive damages. Now, biblical law does call for both restitution and at least 100% in punitive damages awarded to a victim of theft. That's Exodus 22.4. And this was shadowing that somewhat. Uh, biblical law even calls for four- and five-fold restitution in cases involving valuable property which produces returns or has required costly investment. But not even the most extreme cases uh, allows tenfold restitution plus a 135-fold punitive award, which is what that amounted to. Ironically, the determination was not driven by greed, but by the jury's whim based on the defense attorney's statement that McDonald's should be punished uh, to the amount of one or two days worth of coffee revenues. Indeed, this was not even a frivolous case, as many as have supposed. It was a frivolous application of the sanctions to the remedy. The judge did succeed in lowering the penalties, and further appeals by the defense actually ended up the woman with less than she could have settled for in the original case. Now, that much, of course, was greed, no doubt, but the jury's decision was unbiblical, and thus it was unjust in itself. Christian courts and tribunals, which are allowed only to adjudicate according to a biblical law, would avoid these types of ridiculous decisions. Finally, there's the fifth aspect, and that is the finality of the decision and the endurance of the decision. Okay. Finally, we have perhaps the most difficult aspect of private Christian courts, and indeed really of all systems of private arbitration, and that is finality. Every court decision is likely going to be uncomfortable to one party. This means that there will always be an incentive for one of the sides to appeal to yet a higher court or a greater power. 
and indeed, unless there is some final buck stops here, voice of judicial authority, appeals in a free market of private courts would be absolutely endless. Even the completely anti-state anarchist Murray Rothbard, in his very helpful system of libertarian thought that he wrote, uh, he conceded that there must be some accepted final arbiter. He said this, quote, Obviously, in any society, legal proceedings cannot continue indefinitely. There must be some cutoff point. Now, while he criticizes the idea of a state Supreme Court as an arbitrary cutoff point, he nevertheless recognizes the necessity of a legally mandated limit to appeals among even private courts. Again, these are his words. In the libertarian society, there would also have to be an agreed-upon cutoff point. And since there are only two parties to any crime or dispute, the plaintiff and the defendant, it seems more sensible for the legal code to declare that a decision arrived at by any two courts shall be binding. Now, obviously, even this standard cannot be without some ultimate point of coercion. What if, uh, despite the legal code, the defendant still refuses to submit to the judgment? Or yet uh, another court down the line agrees to hear the case even if the other party remains in absentia. Okay, in those cases, it would be up to society at large to enforce the prior decisions. And this may or may not be very easy. There still remains the possibility that a decision has no practical finality. And who will determine whether the prior two courts' concurring decisions were arrived at justly? Okay. Wouldn't that require yet another third-party examination of the law and the facts and the procedure? And so we yet introduce, in that case, another type of appeal. But uh, will this appeal also not be subject to dispute? It seems that there must be some arbitrary aspect to arrive at finality and continuity of decisions in any humanly enforced judicial system. So on either Christian courts or even in Rothbard's libertarian society, we could simply say a free society, if you'd like to call it that, the key factor that will give continuity to legitimate court decisions is public virtue based in personal devotion to God's law. Rothbard is correct to say that there will have to be a legal code. It must be generally accepted, and the standards of limited appeals must arise from that legal code. But if a legal code does not derive from a truly authoritative source itself, then even a generally accepted legal code can only arrive at something like finality by a pragmatic measure, not in principle. True binding authority over man can only derive from a source higher than man, meaning a law higher than man's. This law must be God's law, and this standard must be upheld by courts, especially private Christian courts. Rothbard is absolutely correct on the practical side of the matter. People and the courts must generally agree on the authority of that particular legal code and the court's adherence to it. Without people who agree ahead of time to place limits on their appeals for litigation, which in a free society are really attempts at self-justification against the prior decisions of multiple of your closest and self-chosen peers, then the very principles of justice are undermined in our hearts to begin with, and such a society, society cannot expect to be free. The absence of such virtue is the main ingredient which keeps tyrannies and uh, tyrannical states in operation. As long as people are unable to agree voluntarily to limit appeals to self-justification, and as long as enough of the rest of society refuses to impute continuity to the legitimacy of those limits, then some form of coercive state solution is going to arise and persist to enforce the arbitrary limits determined by the, interesting, uh, the interested and ruling parties. Now, of course, this is true in many areas of civil life, not just the legitimacy of court decisions. That's why there is a necessity for civic virtue. The issue of civic virtue touches the heart and spiritual and, and psychological nature of society, and this is clearly true in reference to the judiciary system in any society. Criminal and civil cases multiply only where people cannot or will not govern themselves, a point made many, many times already, but also where people desire to exact as much revenge or remuneration as possible for the acts perceived against them. Paul makes this point in reference to the Corinthians as well. 
Some of them were bringing frivolous or even fraudulent cases against their brothers just to profit at their expense. And so Paul condemns them openly in the passages we read before. You yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. 1 Corinthians 6, 8. Rush Juni comments on that saying, quote, Just as they give more worth to the pagan courts than they deserve, so they give more worth to their own contentions than they deserve. This is basic human nature, fallen human nature, which is the source of all fraud in human society. The point, however, discovers the vital link between the human vice and the persistence of pagan courts. Deviant hearts wish to avoid godly courts. Instead, they seek out ungodly avenues of authority by which to profit from their vices. Further, such fraud can exist in degrees. A case need not be completely illegitimate to be considered fraudulent. It may rather be a legitimate injury magnified beyond its true warrant. In fact, this is probably the more likely scenario because it allows vice and plunder to proceed under at least some cover of law. And this again is a product of the fallen human heart. It's sometimes by conscious design aimed at enriching oneself or destroying another person purposefully. It is sometimes unconscious. Either way, one should take the advice offered in the essay On Private Revenge, Part 3, written by a very young John Adams. Quote, Let me conclude by advising all men to look into their own hearts, which they will find to be deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Let them consider how extremely addicted they are to magnify and exaggerate the injuries that they are offered themselves and to diminish and extenuate the wrongs that they offer to others. They ought, therefore, to be too modest and diffident of their own judgment when their own passions and prejudices and interests are concerned. To desire to judge for themselves in their own causes and to take their own satisfactions for wrongs and injuries of any kind. Paul's remedies for these situations is spiritual. It is self-sacrifice. He writes, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? This would eliminate purposefully fraudulent cases between brethren. It would eliminate frivolous cases, and it would go a long way toward eliminating most cases. Those only that would survive and should survive are those in which the issue under dispute uh, would significantly weaken the well-being of the victim. But the path to this state of affairs, of course, is one of self-government, controlling the passions and the jealousies and the other emotional vices that drive us to magnify our injuries beyond what they're warranted. Indeed, the true Christian spirit will go further than self-government, It will progress to self-sacrifice, reigning even the desire to justify one's injuries in many or most cases. There was a time when our legal scholars acknowledged this fundamental basic of common law. Again, young John Adams wrote this, quote, The divine author of our religion has taught us that trivial provocations are to be overlooked. Little injuries and insults ought to be borne patiently for the present, rather than run the risk of violent consequence by retaliation. Now, the common law seems to me to be founded on the same great principle of philosophy and religion. A necessary step, then, in recovering a free judiciary system is for people to adopt this Christian mindset. We must increase individual, personal government, beginning at that spiritual level. Before we can even expect anything like society in general to reflect this less litigious, coercive spirit which leverages government courts and forces um, uh, that as a means of self-justification. The basic summary is this. If men will not obey God, they will not obey men. And when disobedience is the common social standard, they will then require the gallows and the gun as the necessary instruments of order. Unless we learn more often to crucify that flesh, we will not progress beyond any uh, such institutionalized force and we'll despair of seeing a free society. But in crucifying that flesh, there must be practical manifestations and applications of it. The spiritual must manifest in the material as we pray, His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Christian arbitration or Christian private courts, 
or free society in general, would further address the problem of continuity by encouraging relevant clauses in contractual agreements. If parties engaging in business had clear arbitration clauses in their contracts up front, then any arbitration decision which followed itself can become a legally enforceable instrument under contract law. If the contract specifies that should any conflicts arise, these parties agree to settle by means of arbitration and that the decision of the arbitration panel will be accepted by both parties as final, then that aspect of the contract becomes legally enforceable, a legally enforceable decision under contract law in civil courts. This would make any recourse to state courts at least predictable, if not pointless. And of course, such a situation would be extreme. Christians should be content uh, to accept the contractual means to which they had agreed without asking a state court to enforce it, or especially to override it, with some fur, uh, further coercive legal decision. The point being made here uh, is about finality. Christians solve the endless appeals problem simply by contractually agreeing to stop the decision of a predetermined panel of arbitrators, uh, traders, or elders. So here are five principles of Christian courts which individuals and churches need to absorb, to learn, and to implement. Considering that some Christians of some confession or other uh, make up about 75% of the U.S. population, if every dispute between Christian and Christian were settled this way privately, it would have several great effects in society. It would make a huge impact on our clogged court system. It would set a powerful precedent of Christian law, virtue and peace and brotherly love for the rest of the society to see and the rest of the world. It could also have an educational effect upon a greater number of Christians in at least two ways. Number one, it would require us to seek answers to more of life's practical considerations from God's Word. And thus it would force us back to those texts of Scripture more frequently uh, and more currently than most Christians are used to. And number two, it would teach them uh, in, in general to learn and to rely on the Christian doctrine of self-government. Just apprehending these two lessons would go a long way in improving society and increasing freedom. So how do Christians do this under pagan judicial tyranny? Earlier we mentioned the uh, problem of secular courts that judge according to a law other than God's law and thus have to set themselves up as rival gods. We noted with R.J. Rushduni how justice is not impossible with such a court, but that it should not be expected. In the American system, which still has vestiges of Christian legal heritage, we might expect proper justice more often than in some other societies, but the possibility still arises, and in fact arises more increasingly as society departs from biblical truth, that the rival gods will uphold and enforce satanic laws and sanctions. It may be that courts call for Christians to engage in acts that are sinful. It may even be that courts threaten punishments upon such Christians in such cases, or that courts provide remedies to others who wish to coerce Christians for their agenda. What should the Christian do in these cases? Well, there is a progression of resistance for Christians to follow. First, we resist peacefully, using the instruments of the law, such as protest, legal appeals, things of that nature. Secondly, where the issues are merely local or state issues, if you have to, you can leave that jurisdiction, move to another one where it better reflects your values. Uh, this option is, of course, greatly magnified under this project's proposal of county rights, where the highest civil authority enforcement for such matters exists at the county level. In the absence of such a decentralized ideal, of course, it may be best in some cases to leave the state or maybe even leave the country. That's up to you. When protest and activism are ineffective and immigration is not uh, practical and preferable, then the Christian must make a judgment as to the severity of the offense to determine whether civil order or Christian conscience should have priority. It may be the case that while the powers have no right to command apart from God's word, sometimes the duty to obey remains the moral course and the pragmatic course for a better society, for at least a tolerant society. And thus we have to obey unto God for the sake of order, not for the sake of the particular human decision. Where a particular law is egregious enough, however, for example, in reference to abortion or sexual deviancy, Christians absolutely must engage in civil disobedience. 
But this has to be done in conscious obedience to God rather than to man, and preferably in concert with some pu public proclamation by a recognized Christian authority. Civil uh, disobedience in egregious cases, necessary cases, is a long accepted and ancient Christian right practiced which modern Christians need to recover. Uh, it's especially true in the United States where we retain many vestiges of a formerly Christian society. The delusion often created by these vestiges means that we tolerate the rotten guts of socialism and humanism in virtually every corner of government and society merely because there remains this paper veneer of Christianity and Christian heritage over the top of it. The greatest advances, however, of Christianity and society throughout history have come when Christians have confronted that rottenness. And toward this motivation, the words of the well-known theologian Francis Schaeffer are very well worth quoting at length. Throughout the whole history of the Christian church, and again I wish people knew their history, in a Christian manifesto, I stress what happened in the Reformation in reference to all this. At a certain point, it is not only the privilege, but it is the duty of the Christian to obey or to disobey the government. Now, that's what the Founding Fathers did when they founded this country. That's what the early church did. That's what Peter said. You heard it from Scripture. Should we obey man rather than God? That's what early Christians did. Occasionally, you know, often people say to me, but the early church didn't practice civil disobedience. Didn't they? You don't know your history again. When those Christians that we all talk about so much allowed themselves to be thrown into the arena, when they did that, from their view, it was a religious thing. They would not worship anything except the living God. But you must recognize from the side of the Roman state, there was nothing religious about it at all. It was purely civil. The Roman Empire had disintegrated until the only unity it had was the worship of Caesar. You could be an atheist. You could worship Zoroastrian religion. You could do anything. They didn't care. It was a civil matter. And when those Christians stood up there and refused to worship Caesar from the side of the state, they were rebels. They were in civil disobedience and they were thrown to the beasts. They were involved in civil disobedience. As much as your brothers and sisters in the Soviet Union were, this is in 1982. When the Soviet Union says by law they cannot tell their children, even in their home, about Jesus Christ, they must disobey and they must get sent off to a mental ward or to Siberia. The early Christians, every one of the reformers, and again I'll say in a Christian manifesto I go through country after country and show there was not a single place, with the possible exception of England, where the Reformation was successful, where there wasn't civil disobedience and disobedience to the state. The people of the Reformation, the founding fathers of this country, faced and acted in the realization that there is no place for disobeying the government, that government has been put in the place of the living God. In such a case, the government has been made a false god. If there is no place for disobeying a human government, that government has been made God. It is simply time that Christians informed themselves on these matters, exalted the proper God to His throne in both their hearts and their society, and get prepared to make decisions and actions accordingly. The early Christians did it, the Reformers did it, and American Christians did it. There is no reason God's people today should not be equally prepared. Now I would like to talk about jury nullification. Another avenue in which we can be prepared to restore the principles of liberty is through jury nullification. This practice was once widely accepted among Christian and early American jurists and lawyers. It has largely been forgotten until fairly recently. Thanks to the, int uh, the increasing interest in the liberty movement, in civic involvement, and the advance of individual rights, we're seeing a resurgence of this principle. The principle itself is quite simple. Juries have the perfectly legal right to determine both the facts and the law in the cases over, the, over which they sit in judgment. This concept sounds radical to most modern ears, but is absolutely true. In cases where the application of a, current, of a current law would actually cause an unjust outcome, or the application of law itself is unpopular, or it's simply a bad law, the jury can remedy the situation. Even if the defendant is technically guilty of breaking the law,
the jury can refuse to find that defendant guilty by declaring the person innocent. Juries have this right, even if the judge instructs them otherwise in any way. Several of the founding fathers understood the principle and the fundamental importance of jury nullification. Even a recent Fox News report on the subject quoted John Adams to this effect, quote, it is not only the juror's right, but his duty to find the verdict according to his own best understanding, judgment, and conscience, though in direct opposition to the direction of the court. Likewise, the first justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, John Jay, said this, quote, You have nevertheless a right to take upon yourself to judge of both and to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. Both objects are lawfully within your power of decision. Unsurprisingly, Thomas Jefferson joined these Federalists in this view. He explained why we should support jury nullification this way, quote, to consider judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions is a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under des uh, despotism of an oligarchy. The power was preserved as basic to preventing government abuse of power. During the ratification debates, this power was upheld as the fundamental check against potential abuses of the Constitution. During the debates in Massachusetts, one Theophilus Parsons who was a supporter of the Constitution and later was a state Supreme Court justice in Massachusetts, proclaimed that the people themselves have it in their power effectually to resist usurpation without being driven to an appeal to arms. An act of usurpation is not obligatory, it is not law, and any man may be justified in his resistance. Let him be considered as a criminal by the general government, and yet only his fellow citizens can convict him. They are his jury. And if they pronounce him innocent, not all the powers of Congress can hurt him. And innocent they certainly will pronounce him if, they supposed, if the supposed law he resisted was an act of usurpation. The framers recognized the importance of this issue from the hard lessons of previous generations. William Penn, who was the founder of Pennsylvania, was a defendant in a 1670 case in England in which he, tried, uh, he was tried for unlawful assembly. He had violated the so-called Conventicle Act of 1664, which forbade religious assemblies of more than five persons for non-establishment Protestants. The act was part of the Elizabethan Acts of Unity, which aimed at centralizing the English church and suppressing all Puritan dissenters and other Protestants. Penn was one of those people. When he was drawn into court, he pleaded not guilty, and the jury upheld his innocence. Not because he had not broken the law, but because they esteemed the particular law unjust. The bench was furious, and they threatened the jurors with imprisonment and deprivation, and it finally uh, upon, uh, settled upon fining each one of those members and imprisoning them until it was paid. A higher court, however, later released those people. The episode was very famous. It was fundamental to our framers' understanding of how courts would become uh, tyrannical and uncontrollable unless we preserve the right of jury nullification. Unfortunately, today is a practice of most judges to remain silent about this aspect of the law and instead specifically misleading juries legally only to consider the facts in the case and not the law. An 1895 Supreme Court decision even ruled that this practice is constitutional. Judges are not required to explain to juries their right of jury nullification. But this by no means make the right, makes the right itself less important. It just means that judges are elitist and don't want average people to have a say in the righteousness of the land of any given law. That they're pressured by large beneficiaries or that they've, uh, for some other reason, leaned toward the side of the prosecution in all cases. Whatever the cause may be, it's unethical, it's counterproductive to liberty in most cases. Despite the judge's shifty silence, the Supreme Court itself has upheld the right more than once in American history. In 1952, for example, the court found that juries are not bound by what seems inescapable logic to judges, and in 1972 that, uh, quote, the pages of history shine on instances of the jury's exercise of its prerogative to disregard institutions of the, or instructions of the judge. The application of the right has a deep, meaningful American heritage as well. 
Juries exercised it against the Alien and Sedition Acts of John Adams, against the fugitive slave laws in the 1850s. It was used against growing corporate power during the height of the Progressive Era and used frequently against alcohol control laws during Prohibition. It was even used in a few cases for Vietnam War protesters. Keeping right with the theme of this whole project, the Fox News report that, that mentioned this more recently said this, quote, A common question I get from people disturbed by these kinds of cases is, what can we do? Well, here's one thing the average system citizen can do. Serve when you're called to jury duty. And while you're there, refuse to enforce unjust laws. If a defendant is guilty of harming someone else, certainly throw the book at him. But if he's guilty of violating a bad law, or if you feel the law has been unjustly applied to him, by all means, come back with not guilty, no matter what the judge, the prosecutor, or the evidence says. Now, for those wishing to have an immediate impact as possible in this regard, you should embrace jury duty when it's called and actively work to spread knowledge of this right among your families, communities, churches, and in public wherever possible. Likewise, interested parties should read and learn as much as possible about the subject. There is at least one organization completely devoted to this issue. It's called the Fully Informed Jury Association, FIJA.org. They provide resources for education. They have a DVD lecture series, even a DVD lecture series designed just for churches. There is yet another avenue by which people can have control over the judiciary, although it is indirectly. And this is Congress's constitutional power to regulate the Supreme Court jurisdiction over any of its legislation. Believe it or not, the, Congress, the, the Constitution gives Congress this power in Article 3, Section 2, and it states, quote, in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions as under the regulations, uh, under such regulations as Congress shall make. In many cases, then, Congress can declare exceptions and regulations upon the jurisdiction of the court, and indeed, it has done so in the past. This uh, power has certain limitations and drawbacks, of course. It is very real. It should be taken seriously, and our senators and congressmen should be very well informed of it. And I'll hope to do a fuller discussion of that aspect in a supplementary lesson. So there you go. The average person who's concerned about judicial tyranny has practical things to do, even in this seemingly incontestable area that's so far over our heads. We can promote private courts or private arbitration. Uh, when applicable, settle our own disputes there. Pledge to remain content with the results. This is especially true for Christians who should have uh, these types of courts already established for themselves long since. Further, Christians should do as much as they can individually to limit uh, litigation in society, and this often means self-sacrifice for mi minor infractions, even for small debts, etc., even large debts if you can handle it. Finally, jury nullification is a powerful tool to halt tyranny in individual cases, and if enough, enough cases strike down the same law, it will set a precedent for changing that law eventually. Interested Christians should research, learn, and then inform their elders and all of, these principles and of all these principles and practices. Granted, these steps will not transform the entire judicial system overnight. But then again, as we've stressed from the beginning of this project, we are planning and working for our children and our grandchildren. <laughs>